be victorious. We, we like sports, we like ball games, we like competitions. But when it comes to a serious thing like victory in his hands, we stand with the victor, we've got the victory. So uh, no matter what kind of virus that may come in front of us, what kind of uh, right that's in our face, um, we've got the victory. I thank God that we have America to be able to freely worship the Lord in. Uh, what's going on here? Number one, you you uh, you voted in a wonderful pastor. Uh, thank God for Brother Eddie and, and his heart to serve the Lord and, and be obedient to to accept the call of pastor here at uh, Adwell Free Baptist Church. Of course, you know this is where I grew up. Uh, my first twelve years of life, and so I've I've got. I've got a, a, a burden for Adwolf Church. Love love the people. Love all of y'all. Many of y'all love me as I grew up. Uh, me and my siblings. So uh, I, want to, I definitely want to continue to, to praise the Lord with you and pray for you as you as you continue to try to reach this area. There's still uh, you know, an, uh, an enormous amount of people that need Jesus just right around the church. <laughs> and so, you know, just thinking about this small area. Uh, right around the church, is, you, you know, there's got to be numerous amount of people that uh, needs the, the gospel trumpet blown in their door. And so, but then outside of that, there's some, a bunch more. So, <laughs> we're in this together, amen. Yeah. Mark, uh, Matthew, actually, Matthew chapter number 16. I told Brother Andy I'd rather listen to him preach. I, we just came to to enjoy some good preaching, but now I have to go to the Now we get to, we, get to <laughs> we got we got second rate preaching here. <laughs> but no, when it comes to the Word of God, any anybody that sounds the truth of the gospel out, you know, it's got to be good <coughs> preaching. And it it uh, this isn't anything new with me. This is God's Word. This is this is something I just want to bring to your attention to remind you to keep your focus where it needs to be. And I pray that, uh, that God will allow me to be his servant. That's what he's called me to be. I'm just simply a servant. I'm a, I'm a newsboy. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a newspaper delivery boy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm one here to just give God, uh, give you what God wants you to have. And, and uh, you know, as I study, as I read through, as I do what I do as a pastor, um, I, you know, for you leaders, and pe preachers and pastors and teachers, you know that you probably get much more out of it than any of the ones who are listening, especially those who are sleeping through the service. <laughs> <laughs> but no, for real, you you have to know what you're talking about before you really get double blessing. And uh, I guess I better cut that down. <laughs> so that uh, won't have any more distractions there. I've got my, since this is, this is uh, off the cuff. I've got my notes stored in this little gadget, so you bear with me. Don't think bad of me. <laughs> just, uh, just, just listen to what God has in store tonight, and just be amazed that we can have some sort of little gadget like this that can can help us to get closer to Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Matthew chapter number sixteen. If you will stand with me, we'll read three, four verses here. It says in verse number seventeen. In fact, let me let me begin here with verse 15. He said to them, that's the apostles, but whom say ye that I am? Don't you love Simon Peter's response? In this passage at least, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath revealed it unto thee, but my Father... Hath, I'm sorry, let me read that back because I've missed an important word there. The word not. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. That word is Petra. Now, Peter in the Greek is Petros. I'm going to use the word Petra. I'll show that to you in a minute. The part of this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was 
Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ. If they haven't figured that out by now, they wouldn't want to figure it out. But uh, I want you to understand the essentiality, and we'll use that, that word there, the essentiality of church, of the church here tonight. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the blessing of already having your sweet presence as we've worshipped worship the name that is worthy. Lord, there's no one in here that is deserving of you. Lord, we know we know who you are. We know in our hearts, Lord, how you've blessed us so many times over and over and over. And Father, Lord, we, we thank you for the opportunity yeah. to be able to do what you would have us to do. And I pray, God, that everything, everything be done here this evening be done for the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, that as people go out here, they'll know that the presence of God is real. And Lord, that um, just like it seems like they've been experiencing here the past few services, knowing that, that you are still in control. And Lord, that your word is going to be faithful. That you and your abilities and your promises is always going to remain faithful. Lord, I just pray that we'll continue to have our eyes focused in on you as you teach us, grow us. We love you, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm really going to preach to you an elementary message. Basically, it's going to be a reminder to you, but even whether it be some listening online or whether it be you sitting here in the pews, it's going to be a good help for us, a reminder for us as Christians to, uh, to do what is important for us along the way. And that is going to church. Amen. Oh, you know what? You're here. You, uh, you have understood the importance of being in church. The Sunday night crowd is most of the time the slimmer crowd throughout the week. And well, what a wonderful attendance here for, for uh, you to be here. But I want you to think about that word essential. Boy, that's been an abused word lately, hasn't it? <laughs> Used and abused. In fact, beginning in March, there's been much confusion in this pandemic era concerning what is essential. And what is not essential? The uh, the term has been loose, used loosely used, and you think about some of our state leaders across the country. After being pressured, they finally came up with some defining of these terms, um, and with a lot of them, the results of their definitions expose their negative thoughts toward church, the Word of God, yeah. Christianity yeah. itself. So here's what I've learned the terms mean, according to our state leaders. The first one in regards is in regards to work. That's where it was first used, in my recollection, because work was essential for us to continue to operate as a country. So this is the way they defined it. Work that's needed to meet basic human needs and safety while sheltering in place. So the word essential was then further defined into the word essential activity. After they defined work, then they came to the point, well, we need to define the activities that people do. We as Americans are free people, so they knew they, did, they better go a little, further, a little bit further than work. So with that broader term in mind, they defined it as anything necessary to survive, like getting groceries, or going to the doctor or pharmacy, or like some of them have thought in their mind, going to go get some beer. So they put that essential. Of course, you know that they're lying in that misconstrued definition. But we got the gist of it with that activity that was essential. So folks like me and you wanted further explanation, especially in regards to church services. There in March and April, well, we was. We were sort of teetering there, trying to figure out what to do as pastors and as, as church people. And, you know, it's becoming less and less attended, church is. Uh, but we thank God for the remnant. We thank God for those who are continuing to stay faithful no matter what pandemic arises. Amen. And so we need to know, we needed to know what they were wanting to require. We do want to honor their leadership and authority that God has given them based on the authority of God's word in Romans chapter number 13. But we still need to hold to the essential importance of church. And so that's what, I'm, that's what I'm going to share with you. 
here this evening. Some are still actually not allowing churches together by their law. As many as uh, of you recall, we followed those mandates uh, just like our church at Whitfield. Y'all uh, went through the phases here in Virginia, one, two, and we're into phase three now. Um, but you know, it could have been a lot worse. Knowing our mind, the, late, the minds of our, our leaders toward church, and so I'm extremely thankful that we're able to do what we're able to do now. Yeah. To have church, to be able to freely worship God. And, and you know what? I, I think about some of those uh, benefits that we've gained through this crazy stuff. There are some positive things that, we've, that we have uh, seen happen. Uh, one is, is Brother Fry back there as he's, he's recording. How many of you were doing that before this pandemic? How many of us churches were doing that? Were you still doing it? I didn't even know y'all were doing it. But we weren't. <laughs> and many other churches weren't. But on Fox News here just last month. His name was Pastor Stacy Shiflett. You might have seen him and, and what he shared. He said, the closer that it is to Jesus coming, the more we ought to be having church, not less church. And he sarcastically said in regards to his critics of having church during this pandemic, what kind of risks are you going to give to your church people? He said, well, we know that the coronavirus only goes to church. It doesn't go to Home Depot. It doesn't go to the grocery store. It only goes to church. We can have 300 people at Walmart in line touching each other, but for some reason, checking temperatures at the door or sitting six feet apart, following a long list of guidelines, is jeopardizing people's health at church. Somebody's blind. We're just going to have church, he said. He brought her to the abortion clinic, but he can't take her to church and something's yeah. wrong. Right. When a woman can take her son to the liquor store, but can't take him to church, something is wrong. Amen. 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 Thank the Lord. Praise this God. evening, I want to share and explain my reasoning behind refreshing our memory an understanding of what church is about, why God established it. So, let's first of all think about that word essential. In terms of our society and what we're experiencing right now, is church essential? Yes. And we all give a hearty yes and amen because we know that on spiritual terms, with, with the spiritual things in mind, it is much more important than any physical yes. thing that we're dealing with. Amen. You know, we that are Christians, we've experienced being, being rescued from our sin, our wayward sins. We know what it's like to be saved from our soul, our hell-bound souls. So let's get into the Word of God and see God's perspective. Hey, let's try that for a little while. People don't exactly like to do that. But let's see God's perspective on what He has for us and the approach that we should take in regards to church. So let's first of all start with its origin. Where did it come from? Well, we, you know, Jesus, even in this passage of Scripture, begins to talk about the word church. The word church of itself, as you think about it in the Greek, it means ecclesia. All right, it is, it is, uh, the Greek word is ecclesia, and it means the gathering of people together. How are we going to have church if we don't have a gathering of people? Amen. He saw it a very important thing. Where did it come from? As you think about the, the, the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10, we, we go to that probably first and foremost before we go to any when it comes in terms to church. But he simply, he made it in simple terms of what he thought of. And I love to hear what God, it, don't, aren't you glad that God doesn't, give you some sort of muddy water to drink. He gives you clear, pure, fresh water. And He gives you clear teachings from His Word if you'll accept it. But that's the big word, right there, the big two-letter word that people struggle with. If. I am. If. You've got to have a humble spirit and a, sub a subjective mind to be able to accept what He has for you. He says, and let us consider one another to provoke or encourage Unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is. 
but exhorting, encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As I think about that passage of Scripture, think about the perspective of God, and you turn to Acts chapter number 2. You find the very beginning of the church. It is immediately after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And, and I say immediately after, there were some uh, X amount of unknown days that is not written in Scripture. After he ascended up in the, into the heavens, that the day of Pentecost came upon them. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost came upon them. And, and this, this is explained in Acts chapter number 2. It says in verse number 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord. Boy, that's, that's something that's important. One accord. In one place. So when you're in one accord, that means you have one purpose, one thing in mind. What is that for us here, folks? To worship the one who is worthy. Yeah. That's not Brother Eddie. That's not the, any fill-in preacher such as I. That's not some Sunday school teacher. That's not anybody else who is unworthy of that glory. It's Jesus and himself. We're here to worship the one who is worthy. Amen. What a wonderful plan that is that God has put in front of us. Even in the origin of the church, it tells us plainly that God placed that for us in that sole purpose to worship Him, to give Him glory in it all. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. <laughs> Supernatural working hand of God appears as, a, as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house that were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I love, I love the Bible. It explains itself. What is the speaking in tongues? I'm glad you asked. It tells us here. Whenever you, you continue on in the scripture. And so many people, they'll get caught up on stuff. Or they'll get stuck on one verse. And they won't go through and read it and, and explain it. The Bible explains itself. It tells us here the rest of this, this passage of Scripture. And they and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under, under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. That means they were confused. Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So what does that mean, Brother David? I'll say it like this. I don't know any other way to say it. I'm speaking English. You're speaking Japanese, Chinese, Spanish. I mean, there's a crowd of people, thousands of people there. And there's a numerous amount of different languages represented. But when they spoke, the work of the Holy Spirit was clear, evident by the sound of the rushing mighty wind and, 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 and just great evidences that appeared there. But one of those was that they could hear them speak the gospel of Jesus Christ in their own language. They didn't go to Chinese school and learn Chinese language, but they could hear the Chinese language in their ears. And I, I'm giving you a, as an example. I don't know that there was any Chinese represented, but I'm just giving you as an example. There are some that are, are mentioned here that were represented. It says, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how we hear every man in our own language, a language wherein we were born. Parthenian, Parthians, and Medes, and Elamites, uh, and the dwellers at Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, in Pontus, and Asia, Phygeria, uh, Pamphylia, and Egypt, and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed. And if you continue on reading through this chapter, this, this beginning of the movement of the church age, you'll find that, that Peter preached a message that was a clear-cut gospel presentation of Jesus Christ and why he was crucified and why they could call upon him. And, and that's really what I want to, I want to turn your attention, uh, attention to that passage. If you will, go to verse number 21. It shall come to pass, Peter speaks, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. You men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, 
a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken by wicked hands and crucified and slain, whom God raised up and have loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And he continues on talking about the prophecy of David and how that David shared that from his heart, knowing that Jesus would come and be that sacrifice to all men. So the message was preached and sounded to every language represented. Hey, there is the miracle handiwork of God where the church was established. 3,000 people saved that day. Another account, a chapter or two over, 5,000 saved. You go to different cities and different countries, there are of Christians who are gathering together. But you, you, you want to... I tell you what, I want you to understand, we got to get further than just the origin of the church. Dr. Jeremiah, I like to study after a whole lot because he is he's a he's a simple kind of a guy because I, that's what I like because I'm a simple kind of a guy. And he said it like this in regards to the church. You got to understand that when the church is spoken of, there's two terms that you got you can't get confused. One is the church as a whole. The second is each individual New Testament church, local New Testament church. Listen to what he says. God calls Christians to avoid any discrepancies between what they say they believe and what they practice. And yet plenty of people who identify themselves as Christians are not actively involved, involved in any local congregation of believers. In other words, many Christians seem to regard regular participation in a local church as optional. I want you to understand me here. As Dr. Jeremiah gets ready to say, that's not what God had in mind. For us to have in mind to think that it's optional to be involved in church? No. He instructs otherwise, Dr. Jeremiah says. The author of Hebrews declares that we should consider one another to stir up love and good works. Stir up those gifts that God has given each one of us to fulfill the plan that God had in store for each local church each local assembly of people, each one of you, have special gifts from God. Amen. Special gifts from God. And the purpose of those gifts is for them gifts to be utilized for the glory of God. Amen. This isn't a one-man show. Amen. This is a, a cumulative group of people who are assembled together to use the gifts God has given them to glorify Jesus. What's the saying? Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors, and here's the people. I remember that whenever I was a kid here at Apple. And that's the way it ought to be. We as the body of believers understand that we are in this church, even at Adwolf Church, to perform the duties that God has given us to serve Him. And it is not something that you deserve. It's not something that you're worthy of. It is a God-given duty. Grace given ability and opportunity that you get to serve. Amen. Have you ever heard somebody say, Well, we got to go to church? <laughs> <laughs> they have missed it. You don't got to go to church, you get to go to church. Amen. Amen. You get to go to church. And as you think about the opportunity that you have, to go to church. I want to also tell you about Romans chapter number 11 illustrating to us that it's only by the grace of God that we have the opportunity. And I'm going to read it to you a little bit of a lengthy reading but I'm going to try to be quick with you but I don't want you to miss it even in my quick reading. I want you to, I want you to gather what God is saying to us in this as Gentiles. If, how many of you are Jews in here? Any <laughs> Okay, I'm just making sure. I say then, in verse number one, hath God cast away his people, his people speaking there of the Israelites. He says, God forbid, or absolutely not, certainly not. For I also am an Israelite, Paul says to the Romans, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, or know ye not what the scripture saith to the lies of Elias? 
how he makes an intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I'm left alone, and they seek my life. He's throwing a pity party in that situation. And I probably would have too, probably been worse than Elijah. But this is what God answered and said to him. I have reserved to myself, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According to his written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they, that they should not hear to this day. I want you to skip down, if you will, to verse number uh, 11. And I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, and this is speaking to the Israelites again, through their fault, salvation is coming to the Gentiles. That's you. That's me. For to provoke them to jealousy. God, God wanted to, do, to shake them up. They were living in sin. They were living in their own pleasure. God had poured blessing on them and blessing on them and blessing on them. And they said, we don't need God. Does that sound like anybody you know? It sounds like the American society. We don't need God. Why are we praying in in, in, in schools. Why do we have the Bible in schools? Why are we mentioning God in schools? Why are we mentioning the name of Jesus Christ in public schools? So they want to get rid of God as quick as they can, don't they? You get into the, the, to the Congress, when these assemblies of the Congress, they they supposed to, from the very beginning, they're supposed to give great glory and attention to God, beginning in prayer, beginning with the reading of God's Word, beginning with the... That's the way it started, the founding fathers, you know, all the way back 200 and some plus years ago. Well, that's long ago. They wanted to get rid of God. They turned their backs on it. And we have to say, we have turned our backs on God because we're Americans too. We're in the number. We are Americans. And I'm like Isaiah, and I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. Not just, in, not just me, but I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. And let's continue on and see what God says to the nation of Israel. He says, For I speak to you Gentiles, I'm sorry, the nation, the Gentiles other than the nation of Israel. For I speak to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I'm magnifying on mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation, which means jealousy again, them which are my flesh and might save some of them, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from death? Or if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, work grafted in among them, and with, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. I want to, I want to stop there for a minute. I want you to understand this illustration that you, how many of you, how many of you uh, have been in the orchards or vineyards or anything like that to understand the grafting and, 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 and pruning and things? Okay, I said a couple of lines you have. Well, this is the illustration Paul tells us, tells the, the Roman people and us today. So let's just imagine we have an apple tree right here. Apple tree has a trunk. We have, it has roots that you can't see under, underneath your feet if you're standing right up against it. It's got roots deep down into the soil. That tree that is, is uh, got the trunk and then the branches off of it. You know, good apples has a good tree, good healthy tree. And so... When you think about this good, healthy tree, you know that, that it's going to produce fruit. But there is something that they do, the orchard farmers do, to make even more healthy fruit. And that is to prune the tree back. Not too much, but enough to, to, to make those limbs stronger and to make the apples bigger and, 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 and more lush. So when they prune them back, there's also a technique that was learned, obviously back then, some 2,000 years ago and probably way before that, where you could graft 
a different variety of apple into that main source. So let's say we have a yellow delicious trunk. How many of you like yellow delicious apples? Right? Amen. Gold delicious, I think. They do. So you got a, a, a golden delicious trunk. You want red delicious with it. You can do that on that tree. Oh, you're kidding me. Ask some of these people that's experienced. You can take a, and there's a certain way that you practice that you've got to do it. You've got to make sure you take the right kind of a branch that's, that's a, a capable of bringing a source of, of vitamins and minerals to the rest of that stem. You can actually intertwine those trunks, those stems, to where that they will grow together. And it will produce red delicious apples on this golden delicious tree. You can do that with any of them. Whether it be honey crisp or gala or I, mean, what, I don't even know the variety of different apples. Virginia Beauty, I'm presents. Virginia Beauty. <laughs> you see, that's what he's illustrating in this passage of scripture. The nation of Israel was the main, what well, Jesus was the main trunk, and the, the, the nation of Israel was the main attention. The first branches, the olive tree. But because they turned their back on God, they were cut off, pruned. And in place was the wild olive tree, you and me, yeah, yeah. by the grace of God. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the purpose involved there is so that God can continue to be glorified in his being. Sure. The nation of Israel would quit. He needed somebody to step up. Yeah, yeah. We as Gentiles now have the opportunity. Yeah. Don't think like the, the BLM and any other of those crazy groups. I deserve to be in the grace of God. It wouldn't be grace if you had that attitude. Right? You wouldn't be accepted with that attitude. You've got to humble yourself. First, humble yourself. Understand, you are unworthy. You are deserving right. of, from, from, from God to be separated from God forever in the pits of hell. Amen. You are nothing more than an undeserving, un, uh, unworthy, Amen. filthy bunch of rags in your heart Amen. and soul. Right. You've got to understand, only by grace. But you were grafted in. Grafted in. Yeah, and then when you were grafted in, I want you to understand, don't, don't, don't think that this is, okay, I'm grafted in, I'm good to go. No, God, God said, hey, look, let's get busy. Let's, let's reach them, man. Let's get out there and get those who do not yet know me as personal Savior, Lord of their life. It's not just a preacher's job to do that. It's not just a Sunday school teacher's job to do that. It's not just any of the church leaders' job to do that. It's every person who's called upon the name of the Lord. It's every person's responsibility to reach them. That's how we're going to grow the church, folks. And that's how we are going to perform the duty that God first placed on us when he established the church. And so think about it for a minute. What is it that you could do for the Lord? Here. An apple. Yeah. You know, if you were to do what God asked you to do, placed on your heart, gifted you to do, you know what it does for the rest of the church? Yeah. Man, what encouragement. And just think about that pastor that, that God has placed here. What encouragement, what a thrill he gets. Hey, he's actually, he's actually up here and he's able to, to, to feel excited because God is working in your hearts and you're doing something about it. Amen. 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 That's what he wants. It's what God wants. Yeah, surely that's what the pastor wants. But it's a thrill to the pastor. It's a thrill to, to each other. It's provoking unto good works. That's what that's talking about in Hebrews 10. And as you continue on with the maturing process of a Christian life, you think about those, those things that God gives you and you grow. Yeah, you fail. You, you struggle. You do some things that's dumb. I mean, you've ever done them. <laughs> but you've got to repent and get back on your feet and keep going. Don't act like you're, 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 you're sinless. Don't act like it's your perfect. You've not arrived to heaven yet. So as you mature in the spiritual gifts that God has given you, you've got to remember, lastly, that you've got to persevere. On a very personal level, your ability to stay the course as a Christian is directly linked to your participation in the body of Christ. It's important to go to church. 
But it's more important. But it's also important as well to be active in your church. Now, so many people have just neglected going to church. But I'm telling you, those who do go to church, you and me, who consider church going as important, be active. Do something. God has given you the ability to, 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 to take, if nothing else, to take the gospel to your neighbors, to the community around you. To be encouraging to your children or grandchildren. To be encouraging to your nephews and nieces. To be encouraging to your friends, foes, hey, to your enemies. Yeah. Give them the gospel. That would be the best way to make them a friend rather than a foe. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. You show them that you care. You love them. Our enemy, Satan, constantly seeks to detour God's people away from God's path. Those who fail to meet regularly with other believers will be more likely to give up in the face of temptation, discouragement, or problems. So if you as a Christian, so if you are a Christian who is not actively connected to a local community of believers, prayerfully take that next step, Dr. Jeremiah says, to join a church and get involved. Others need the benefit of your gifts and service and faith. And their strength and encouragement will help you keep the course. Yeah. So I continue, there's many other passages of scripture, but I've, I've, I've run out of time. I want you to, I really want you to be encouraged to stay the course with the Lord. He's not ever left you hung out to drive. He's been faithful to you all along the way. All along the way. Church is important. Staying faithful in church is a very important thing. And I tell you, you're here on Sunday night, the rarely uh, attended service. You're here. You're, you're the faithful one. Stick with it. Don't give up just because some sort of a, a disagreement that may, be, uh, that may occur in the future. Ah, oh, that won't happen. <laughs> Are you on planet Earth? <laughs> Even in church, there's going to be some disagreements. Sometimes major, sometimes minor. But in each disagreement, God is still there. He's still faithful. He's got control of it. You remember to just continue to go through, be faithful to the Lord, keep you cool. Yeah. Love Jesus. Yeah. Love people. Yes. You get that all figured out right there. You can go through any disagreement, whether it be your spouse or not, too. The essentiality of the church. I believe it's essential, don't you? You know, we we have the opportunity as people here on God's creation to make the best of it. We've lived so many ex amount of years that's, that's already behind us. Sometimes we look back and there's some regrets. Sometimes we look behind us and there's great blessings. So so wonderful, many praises and thanksgiving because of what God's done through you. Make more of those. Till the end of this life comes. I'm going to tell you something. This ain't the end. Right. <laughs> it's the beginning of the rest of eternity once we exit this world. So make the best of it while we're here. Let's stay interject. Let's stay, let's stay excited. I love you folks. Admiral, Brother Eddie, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of your brother. <laughs> <laughs> that is challenging, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> I think that's messages we need, it's challenging messages that yes. challenges us to do something. And uh, you know, when you get to the gift section in the Bible, there are many gifts that are listed. We may not personally have more than I believe God will gift us all to have a gift. And he us with that to be able to use that in the local church. Yeah. Some people have more than one gift, but I believe God will give you at least one that you can use. Now, what are you going to do with that that God's given you? Either you want to use it or you put it on the shelf and not use it. You know what happens to that that you put on the shelf and don't use? Don't use it, you lose it. So uh, I think it's been very challenging to us tonight. To, to be like uh, Isaiah said when uh, he got the vision and, and he said, Lord, here am I. Send me. Can God use us individually? 
I guarantee you can. I guarantee you can. The ones that I find throughout the Bible weren't the most talented, weren't the most gifted, didn't have the greatest of abilities. They were just ones that said, Lord, I'll be used to you. Yeah. And if you'll do that, God use you, I'll assure you. Let's start. We're going we're gonna to close. I want you to just bow your heads tonight and, and be like I say, Lord, hear my what can you do in and through me to help as Brother David said, not the church, and I think that's that, that that's the, the the big goal is to be a, a, a part, the makeup of the church. But we're of the local church. We're Bad Wolf Real Baptist Church. God use me to better the church, to better this church. And I believe if you'll mean that, say, Lord, I want to be used of you. Now, it may take you a little bit out of your comfort zone from time to time. But if you'll desire to be used of the Lord, God used you. And uh, we grow a, a better church, a greater church, because people are just willing to be used of the Lord. So you pray tonight, God use me. Father. Thank you for the good word of God. Thank you for the message and the messenger tonight. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and caring about us enough to speak to us. And, Lord, you do it so gently and so kindly. And you just remind us. And sometimes that's where we're at. We, we, we know what we ought to do. But sometimes we just need that little extra nudge to get us busy and get us actively involved in doing what we ought to do. So Lord, I pray tonight that we'll take the message and Lord, we'll not only have heard it and not only will we apply it, but we'll take it home with us and we'll become actively involved in that which you'd have for us to do. There's still a great work to be done. You've not come yet. There's still lost that need to be saved. And so, Lord, I pray, take us and use us for the glory of God that your name might be glorified and honored. And we'll thank you and praise you in Christ's name. And amen. 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 Well, come back on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. On Wednesday night, we've been dealing with the subject of... The church. We've been talking about the church for years. And boy, I just kind of put the ice and right on the top of that case. It's been a lot of come in from You know, talk about this in one accord. And that didn't mean a Honda. You'll get that when you get home tonight.